I might just cover just briefly uh, avoiding poor work habits. I've been talking about that a little bit. One of them is to don't stroke or brush the patient's skin between each insertion. Now, I haven't noticed anybody in this class doing that, but we have people who are skin brushers. They put the needle in the follicle, take the needle out, and then brush the skin. And they take another insertion, and they take it out, and then they brush the skin. Between each insertion, they wiggle or brush or make it feel good for the patient. This is kind of like a mother who said, oh, don't worry, it won't hurt. Now, we don't go so far as to kiss the wound, but we do rub it a little bit with loving, tender care. Now, if you do that between each insertion, you're going to be very slow. We have the other one who also goes a little bit further, has a little piece of cotton in a dish. And between every hair or every second or third hair, they rest and relax and wipe the area off and talk to the patient a little bit and then proceed from there. Now... They can wipe their own skin off. They can apply a little cotton when they get home. And they just as soon not have you waste time doing that when they're paying you good money. So anything that slows you down has to be eliminated. Stopping after each epilation. There's no reason why you have to stop between each insertion. Now, if you're not sitting properly on the stool, if you haven't got your feet adjusted, if your legs get tired from stepping on the switches, it's because you haven't got the switches in the right place. And you haven't got your body balanced properly. They put them out here way on the tips of their toes. And they press down so that they put the needle in the follicle and then they, their whole body moves up and down. They're trying to reorganize. Now, you should get the switches under the ball of your foot. If your shoes don't enable you to do that, then you've got to get shoes that do enable you to do it. So that... When you relax your legs, the weight of your legs turn the switches on. Now you only use your muscles to stop the machine. You don't use the muscles to start it. If you use the muscles only to stop the current, then as you become tired, you go faster because you want to rest more. If you work the other way, so that you use your muscles to step on the switch, then as you get tired, you go slower and slower and slower. Because when the current's on, you're working. Now, the unnecessary toying with each hairs. You take a hair, you look at this one, and you wiggle it a little bit, and you look at that one, wiggle a little bit, and you sit and think, which of those three shall I take? No, I don't like that. I'll take this one. And so you're now making a big decision. Each time before you insert, you're going to decide which hair to insert in. And if you start inserting in hairs that you can't see, then you, you've got to worry about yourself. If a person comes in and they want a half hour's treatment and they want you to take all the big black ones off the chin, for God's sakes, take off the big black ones. Don't come over here and take off one black one and then five little tiny insignificant ones nearby it just because you happen to see them. The woman isn't seeing those. Those are not the hair that she wants. You have no idea how many complaints I've had from people who call up and tell me, where is your nearest office to so-and-so? I say, well, why? What problems are you having? Well, the girl there, she's very nice, but she just will not work where I want her to. I tell her where I want the work done, and she spends all her time in one little spot. If what they want is for you to take out the deep, coarse, heavy hairs, then take out the deep, coarse, heavy hairs. And don't look through your loops continuously. Look over your loops or look under your loops and look around to see where the hair are. Remember, under magnification, you tend to... See hairs that the patron doesn't see. Now, when you order something, you want what you ordered. If you want a certain variety of food and the, and the waitress decides what she's going to bring you, you think she was crazy. If you went into a doctor and you told him what illness you had and where your pain was and he started to treat your feet or your head or something, you'd say, what's wrong with this guy? And here a patron comes in and she knows what she wants. And you decide you'll treat where you want. You're trying to sell a service. You're trying to satisfy a patron. You won't satisfy them unless you remove the hairs they want removed. I've had them where they've gone so far as to paint each hair with a little nail polish. When I looked at them, I couldn't figure out how the hair had all these little red points on it. I said, what's all this? She said, I want the ones taken out with the red polish on them. Don't bother with anything else. So you do. Not every little tiny fine blonde hair on a woman's face is going to become a coarse hair. 
This usually occurs after you have taken off a lot of the great big heavy ones. And they then want you to start taking out the next heaviest and the next heaviest and the next heaviest. In other words, finer and finer and finer and finer hair are being sought after. You get them where they come in, you can't see any hair on them at all. You put your glasses on and you look and you look and you look and you finally find a few little blonde hairs. The people who do this are people who think that if they catch the hairs when they're little tiny fine ones, that will keep them from becoming big black ones. So what they are trying to do is to destroy the hair in the small stage before it becomes a big hair. Now I will admit, if you're having trouble with weeds in your lawn, like dandelions, every little tiny dandelion is going to become a big dandelion. But that's not the way it is with the face. A woman who has an accelerated lanuga growth, she may have longer than normal lanuga hair. But that's not what's bothering her. What's bothering her are the great big black ones that are obvious. When you get the big black obvious ones away, she'll then start a program for the intermediate hairs, of which there are millions, and she nor you will not live long enough to ever complete the case. Now, when you have a patron who is doing that, you have to start to talk to them and tell them that not every little fine hair on their face is going to become a big one. No way. And that her best way to handle this case is for her to come in to see you about every three months. And for every three months when she comes in, you will pick up the biggest and the longest and the coarsest. But don't go after a program of removing all of that intermediate hair. Now, in a given year, there might be a very small percentage of those Lanuga hairs might actually turn into deep coarse terminal hairs, but only a small percentage. And therefore, take them as they appear and don't try to head them off. You can't do it. How do you know which one's going to become a deep one? Now, unnecessary stretching or pulling of the skin, holding the hair with the tweezers before inserting. The hair's coming out of the follicle, and you grab the hair with the tweezers and you bend it back and you hold it up in the air and then you insert the needle under it. This slows you down. Furthermore, if you hold onto the hair when you insert, if you take this hair and you bring it up to here and hold it with your tweezers, you cannot get a good angle on this down here. As long as you're in the follicle, you're going to get at least half of it, half the follicle wall is going to be treated. And if you're worried about treating this opposite side, then remove the hair, in which case the follicle will close down on the needle from both sides, and you will then have contact with the follicle side walls from both, both sides. Remember, when you insert the needle in the follicle, here's the follicle wall, here's the hair. Now you're going to put a needle in there, so the needle's got to go alongside of the hair, so the follicle's got to stretch out to go around it. So the needle is going to be in contact with this part of the follicle. It's not going to be in contact with this part because the hair is between the needle and the follicle on this side. If you take the hair out, you'll then get some lye on the side that was protected by the hair. This is one of the reasons for the aftercount. This is one of the reasons for when you're removing a deep, coarse, heavy, bulbous hair, that if you get the hair out and give it a couple of seconds after count, your chances of getting that particular hair in that follicle is much greater. Now, pressing the dimple in the skin. When you make an insertion, and you've got to be extremely careful with a bent needle, if you make an insertion in the skin, let's say that's the level of the skin, and you make an insertion and you dimple this thing down like this, you now have the needle in the follicle. This is where the skin used to be. That was the skin level. You've now dented it down to there. If you maintain this dimple around the needle, and then you let the currents run, as the currents run, the action of this current will be to disintegrate, decompose down here, and pretty soon the skin will come back up here. Now, if you've held a needle at the same depth, as the skin moved up, the needle went through the bottom. Now, this means you start out with a good insertion, but after you have worked a few seconds, the needle has gone down, the skin has come up, so you, in effect, have now made a newer insertion you've now inserted through the bottom of your follicle. To keep from doing that, 
And naturally, when that happens, it slows your technique down. You've now got the, uh, the follicle moves up, the needle's down the bottom, so you're getting action all underneath it where you don't want it. And your current then diverts to the new area, and it doesn't get up to the top area. So your technique, which started out to be maybe an eight-second technique, if you start maintaining these dimples, will turn into a 10 or 12 or 15-second technique, depending upon how deep you allow it to go. Now, it's easy to see that happening, because let's say that when you first inserted, you inserted to there on the needle. And then after five or six seconds, you notice that you're now that deep. Try to keep the depth of the insertion uniform during the time the current's on. And one of the ways to do that is, if the skin depresses when you insert, then get the needle into the follicle and then raise your needle so the skin comes back up to level. Don't back the needle out of the follicle, but just raise the needle so the dimple disappears. If the dimple disappears, then everything will stay in relationship while the current's on. If you maintain the dimple, and halfway through your timing, the dimple disappears, it could be because the needle has eaten itself a hole, and therefore the skin climbed up on the needle. Now, treating it too shallow an angle, if the angle is flat, and you put the needle in like this, and then you make the dimple, the needle will actually touch the skin between here and here before it gets in the follicle. This is very common to have happen under the neck, because your insertions under the neck are rather flat. And if you get in at an angle for that type of hair, and then you press down with your needle, you touch the skin with the needle before it enters the follicle. That takes your high frequency off. Your high frequency will go off into that wet skin, and nothing will come off the tip of the needle. Here again, the answer is lift up so that you bring this follicle up to a higher level, so that the follicle is up here and the needle is in, and the needle does not touch the skin. When you're working in an armpit, and you're using one of our bent needles, that's the time that it's easiest to do that you have a tendency not to notice that this part of the needle is touching down in that armpit. And that armpit is wet. The armpit is a very moist area. And if this part of the needle touches the skin before it enters the follicle, your technique is all off. What would have been enough high frequency to release it nicely will not release it if it's dissipating at this point. It's just like making twice the depth of insertion. When your tweezers are touching your needle, that high frequency is not going in the follicle. When your tweezers touch the needle, your high frequency is being dissipated onto your tweezers. If you have a lot of trouble trying to pick up the hair, and you keep picking and picking and picking at your needle, each time you pick at the needle, you're dissipating high frequency off into the tweezers. I've seen people where they get a hold of the hair and rest the tweezers and the hair against the needle. Don't rest your tweezers on your needle. And some of you have a tendency to have the needle out of the chuck a long way. Here's the chuck of the needle holder. And you have the needle way out here. Be careful you don't rest your finger against this needle. And if your finger's resting on the needle, you're taking the high frequency off. This is Mike. I'd like to add a couple more recommendations to Hinkle's lecture. Here are my suggestions. Sometimes your needle holder was not properly constructed. In this case, when you screw down the cap, there is still some of the metal chuck exposed. If you touch this metal piece with your finger, the high frequency short circuits into your finger and you get little to no high frequency in the follicle. Additionally, latex or vinyl gloves are not thick enough to fully insulate the high frequency from being drawn off. If you are practicing the two-hand technique with progressive epilation, a very common mistake is to pull on the hair too soon, before the current has released the hair. If you're getting a nice release in, say, 8 seconds, don't start pulling on the hair in only 2 seconds. If you do this, the skin gets pulled up, and at the same time, the needle gets pushed deeper into the skin. Tugging too soon increases your release time because the high-frequency heating pattern is now below the follicle. If you know the hairs epilate in about 8 seconds, then gently test the hair after, say, 6 or 7 seconds. To avoid constant pulling on the hair, 
hold the hair with your tweezers, and loop the hair back. In this way, you are sure of not putting tension on the hair. As you count seconds, gently test the hair until you get a smooth release. Oh my God, stackers. This is one of my pet peeves. Lots of electrologists do it. They place a cotton ball near the work area, then they carefully take each epilated hair and meticulously stack them on the cotton ball. Each time you stack a hair, you take your focus off the work area and waste a lot of time. Stacking slows you down. When you epilate a hair, don't worry about where the hair goes. Just let it drop, or if you must stack, place the hairs on the patient's skin next to where you're working. And when you're finished, just wipe them off. So one last suggestion. Actually, this is the number one complaint that I've heard over the years against electrologists. Too much chatting. Okay, it's not very nice to mention this, but that complaint is number one. Sure, we all love to talk about all sorts of things. However, when you're working, especially on the face, conversation slows you down. Even if you're the only one talking, your chit-chat slows you down. I mostly do body work, but I know that even when I'm the only one talking, my attention is not 100%, and consequently, my work is slower. Sometimes we have a talkative client. In this case, I actually tell them to button it up until we're done because they're wasting their own time. Okay, thanks for watching, and please leave a comment. I love them.